Well, hello, dear friends. A video I've been promising you for a long time. The 30 most important tips in the kitchen. The thing that I've learned in the last 54 years as a professional chef. I think it's about 56 now. I always say 54. I think it's about 56. Doesn't matter. It's over 50. <laughs> so, friends, um, they're very important. I'm going to start with the most important. Mise en place. Mise en place. What does that mean? Well, if you translate it exactly in French, it means put everything in place. It doesn't really mean that much, but what it actually means in cooking, have all your ingredients ready to go to put in the pot. Chop and dice at the right size, and they're ready to go, so you don't have to be doing any more chopping and dicing and, and anything. You can start cooking and have fun. Believe it or not, friends, this is the most important thing you can possibly do, and this is probably the thing that is most discarded by most people. They take a recipe, they read it, and they start chopping and start cooking. It's stressful. It's not fun. It takes away the fun of cooking. Remember what I always say, friends. If you're not having fun in the kitchen, you're not doing it right. So do yourself a great favor and do your mise en place. As a matter of fact, since it is so important, I want to make a big deal out of it. And I decided I'm going to read a few comments that you guys have sent. We are so lucky. We have a million, almost two million followers or subscribers to our channel. And we received an amazing amount of email, amazing amount of comments. And I love them all. I try to read them all. But mise en place, a lot of you have said mise en place. Cooking was something stressful before. And I, I didn't get the name. Sometimes people put things, I can't get the name of it. Cooking was something stressful before. I started getting everything ready first. Mise en place is the most important advice I learned from you, chef. Since I've been using it, my enjoyment of cooking has increased beyond belief. Another one. Cooking was something stressful before I started getting my mise en place. Everything ready first. Mise en place first, the most important. I don't know if you can call it a skill, but it certainly is a big upgrade after starting doing it. One more. 100% prepare the ingredient, prepare the ingredient, waiting for me in a refrigerator, and I am ready to do a relaxed cook this evening with my dinner guest. It's not just the recipe, but it's the whole approach to the meal prep. So friends, do yourself a great favor. Be disciplined. Do not start, don't turn it. The, the stove on until your mise en place is ready. Now, you may turn the oven on, but not the pots and pans. All right? Number two, and very important. I'm not going to put them by numbers, so, but another very important thing, friends, sanitize water. By the way, I got a list because I know I'm going to forget half of the stuff. So at least that list is going to keep me straight. Uh, sanitize water. Why do I have a sanitize water? Well, friends, if you're going to cut chicken, meat, fish, any kind of protein, you're going to put it on that cutting board because you want to use a cutting board. You want to use a soft material to cut things. It's not glass, not marbles. Even the hard plastic is not so good for your knife. Wood is actually the softest thing for your knife. You want to sanitize it. How do you sanitize it? This, friends, I have taught thousands of cooks through my career to do this. I cannot cook. The first thing I do when I come into my kitchen, I make my sanitized water. And, and sanitized water is very simple. It's water and bleach or water and white vinegar. When do we use which one and when do we use it? Now, if you're going to cut protein on a cutting board, friends, and, uh, and soapy water is not good enough. You got to sanitize it. So what I do is... Uh, uh, oh, bleach and water, you're going to say, oh my God, bleach, you're going to kill us. Well, if you go to the CDC website, it tells you that bleach and water, and water are okay as long as it's 10 to 5,000 parts per million. We calculated one tablespoon of bleach for one gallon of water. You can't, you can't smell it. You can hardly smell it. Certainly less than your pool water than you drink every time you go to the pool. So... <laughs> Believe me, it's not going to kill you. I've been using it for my whole career. I've never killed anybody. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Some, uh, something for a chef. Oh, this guy killed three people. No. Friends, I've been doing it my whole life. I promise you my cutting board has no smell. 
do yourself a favor, smell your cutting board and see what it smells like. Okay, if it smells kind of funky, uh -huh, you better sanitize. So, water or vinegar, one tablespoon for one gallon, or uh, uh, vinegar is uh, one part vinegar, four part water, white vinegar. You know the one you used to clean the floor and the window with? Not the champagne vinegar you're cooking with, white vinegar, cleaning materials, perfect for that. If you're doing vegetables, you're doing but if you're doing protein, I highly recommend use the bleach. Up to you, my friends, use whatever you want, but I promise you, you do this, you'll never go back. You'll use it all the time. It's really, really important. All right? Next thing, um, very important, friends. Before you start cooking, first thing you want to do, you got a recipe. You want to read it from beginning to the end. Read the directions. Read the whole thing. Spend two minutes reading. And I know most of you start a recipe. Okay, here we go. On you know, Let me start cutting. Oh, I need carrots now. Oh, well, I don't have any carrots. Oh, I need it. Do yourself a great favor. Read the whole thing. See what you need. Make sure you have the ingredients in place. Make sure you have the right equipment you need. You may need a pot. You may need to preheat the oven. You may need to cook some rice for this recipe. You may, cook, you may need to pre-cook some vegetables in advance. You may need to take some butter out <laughs> so you have a room temperature butter. That's right. Otherwise, at the end, you will put cold butter in the sauce and separate. All of those things are... Not that you know where the butter... Let's call that as an advice. Leave the butter on the counter the whole time. You never know when you need it. You know, and it's nice to look at it. It makes you feel better. Mental support is very important. So read the recipe from beginning to the end, friends. All right? Next, very, very important, cutting board. Now, let me take the paper and put it away. Cutting board, get as big of a cutting board as you can. If you have a big space, it makes it so much more fun to cook. If you have a big cutting board. You want to get a good wood cutting board, but you want to get one that has two sides. You want to get a flat side when most 90% of your cooking is going to be for the flat side. But now if you're cutting up a, a, a roast, you're cutting up a turkey, you got all that juice, what are you going to do with it? It's going to go all over the place. That's why you need a groove in here. You see? Right there. So then we, you only need this when you have... A, a roast. Otherwise, you're cooking uh, uh, herbs and garlic or whatever, and they go in a groove, and it's a pain to clean. So you want to make sure that this is only when you know you're going to have juice. Cutting up a chicken, cutting up anything that's got juice, this is what it's for. All right? Otherwise, use the regular cutting board. Oh, before I forget, you notice right there, friends? This thing right there. Let me put this right there. You hear a lot of people telling you on YouTube all the time, everywhere I'm seeing it, put a wet pepper towel, or put a wet towel on it. What's the worst thing I cut up into wood for us? It's water. You do not want to put a wet anything under your cutting board the whole day while you're cooking. Eventually it'll warp. Water is no good for the, for the uh, board. The last thing you want to do, by the way, is put a cutting board in the dishwasher. Even if it's a little one, if it's, don't put it in there, please. Wood, wood do not like so much water. So look what I got. I got those things right here. You buy those at uh, like a, a, a dollar store. You, got, you buy those at the Target. You buy it's called, um, what is it called? It's called a thick grip liner. Grip liner. You, you know, a lot of people use them to dry dishes and things. It's perfect. Cut it up, and you know what? Cutting board does not move. Okay, so do, don't listen to anybody tell you to put something wet on it, okay? Be, do yourself a great favor. And you know what it does, friends? It, it raises the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the cutting board enough so then you can put your scraper right here. See? Look, I put it right there. This is my scraper. This is a tip you must do, friends. You got to have one of those scrapers instead of using the back of your knife. Okay? So that would be another tip. Really, really important. And you know, boom, put it right here and you get ready to go. Okay, one more thing, friends. When you get a cutting board, you want to oil it. Oil it. You want to uh, put a mineral oil, wood oil. Um, that's what they call it, wood oil. That's what I've been calling it, I hope. Mineral oil, uh, cutting board oil, whatever it is. Look, look what I do, friends. I do this at least once a month. If you, you can do it more, twice a month, there'll be nothing wrong with that. You take a little paper towel and 
you rub it in. You see, look. Now, don't be afraid. You don't want to put a little more in here. It'll be perfectly fine. But this is enough right there, friends, for the whole board. You put it on, and you see, and you rub it all on there right there. Now, this I do at night. I'm done. I go to bed. And the next morning, you know what I do? I just take a, a soapy rag that I always have. And, uh, oh, you know, I always put a bit of sanitized water in my sanitized water. I always put a little soap, right? And right there, my cutting board is ready to go. If you do this at least once a month, twice a month, your cutting board will stay beautiful. And, and you don't have to worry about water damaging it. All right, friends? So this is there for the cutting board. But very important, get as big of a one as you can. All right? Another very important difference. Clean as you go. You're chopping up some herbs, thyme, rosemary, uh, onion, whatever it is. You're chopping it up. You're finished with it. You're doing your mise en place anyway, right? Take it up. Put it in a bowl. Get it out of the way. Clean up. Get yourself a rag. Next ingredient. Next ingredient. You know, when I was a professional chef in the kitchen... I knew which one of my cooks was not doing their job correctly because I would come in, I go, I see you just did some thyme, you just did some garlic, and you just started some carrots. How do you know that, chef? I say, look at your curry board. You got everything on it. So now your thyme's got some carrots in it, the, the, your, your carrots got some garlic in it. Clean up as you go. All right? <laughs> All right, friends. Um, let me go to, to another page now. All right. Another important tip is what temperature do we use on our burner? Medium, high, low, on the burner? It's a question I can never answer. I don't know what kind of size burner you have. I don't know what kind of size fry pan you have. I don't know what kind of oil you have. I don't know what kind of cooking you're doing. It's impossible to answer that. To be on the safe side, here's what you do, friends. Always go medium. You go in the middle of it. You're, you're doing the fine. You're not too high. You're not too low. You go at the beginning of it, and you raise it as you are more comfortable. The question I'm asked too often also is, do we start with a cold oil and a cold pan, hot oil and a hot pan? How do we do it? Which one do we do first? The simple way to do this is to start with a cold pan, put your oil in it, and get it to the temperature you want. And a good saute temperature is 365 degrees. Now. There's many ways to figure it out. The easiest way, friends, is to use a digital thermometer, a, a uh, instant reach, whatever you call them. It's not instant reach. It's a digital thermometer. It's a laser thermometer. They're not expensive. They get you to 365. You know you're at the right temperature. If you don't have one of those, there's also those uh, old technique where you put a wooden spoon in the oil, and you'll see... Uh, uh, Jack is going to show you one of the little video. You can see when you put the, uh, the, the wooden spoon in the cold oil, you got no bubble. The minute the oil reaches close to 365, 375, you'll see bubble on it. It's coming up. You'll see a lot of different bubbles on there. That'll get you the oil 365. Do yourself a favor. Get yourself an early birthday gift. Get yourself a digital thermometer, laser thermometer. That'll really help you. And also, remember, the right temperature of the oil, if you put it in at the right temperature, the oil will cover the bottom of the pan, ensuring an even uh, 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 oil in the pan, so not much sticking. Number two, very important, it'll get you a really nice Maillard reaction, caramelization of the protein, giving you a nice crust. All right? Next very important tip, next very important thing to cover, friends, is butter. When do we use whole butter? When do we use clarified butter? Clarified butter, whole butter. Now, this clarified butter is kind of a warm room temperature, so it's a little liquid. But normally, if you put the clarified butter in the refrigerator, which would be nothing wrong with it, it's going to be the same consistency as regular butter. So why do we use one versus the other, and when do we use one versus the other? Well, what's the difference? When you look at it, what's the difference in those two? Well, butter has milk protein. Milk protein burn very fast. 250, 300, not even 300, 250, they start burning. So we remove them. And that's what you mean by clarified butter. Clarified butter is mean the butter than the milk protein that burns really quick have been removed 
So now we have a butter that can cook up to 450 degrees. So that's when you use clarified butter. Now, when do we use it? We're doing steaks, for instance. We're doing something that's going to be in a fry pan quite a while to really get some really nice Maillard reaction. We're going to use a clarified butter or a cooking oil, a vegetable oil, a avocado oil, whatever you want, a high smoke point oil. I'll do a show on all the different oils so you'll know. Okay, but just to, to, to touch it on today, we'll use a clarified butter when we're going to be in a pan for a while and we're going to really wait for the, the steak to cook or the lamb chop or whatever, the, or the chicken to get really nice and golden brown. And we may cook it in a fry pan the whole time. We are not going to finish it in the oven. We, we have to have a high smoke point butter. Regular butter, as we just talked about it earlier, as milk protein, it burns very fast. So when do we use it? Why well, we use it when we're making a sauce. Let's say we're sauteing some shallots in butter, and, uh, and we know we're going to be right here. We're sauteing, we're reheating some vegetables, <coughs> green beans, asparagus. We're reheating those beautiful vegetables. So butter is perfect because we're never going to get it to this high point. We're never going to overcook it. So that's when we want to use regular butter. And also at the end, of a, of a sauce at the end of a, any food preparation, you add butter. And uh, now remember, butter is an emulsion, remember? Because we remove the milk solid out of it, so butter's got it in there, and uh, it's an emulsion, and if you bring it to boil, you know when you, you do melted butter, what happened? It becomes liquid. You don't wanna put that in the sauce at the end because you're missing the whole texture thing, all right? So whole butter, when we're not gonna burn it, we're not gonna overcook it, that's when we use it, all right? I hope I, I, I clarified that a little bit, all right? Another very important subject, how do we cook with wine? And, and, and why do we reduce wine by, the high, by, by half? You heard me say that all the time. You cook with wine, you got to reduce it by half. Well, why, what does it do? Well, it burst, burns off the alcohol and it helps intensify its flavor. It concentrated its taste. Um, talking about taste, when, when you, you're cooking with wine, I said, you know, cook it until it's reduced and test it. And uh, you got to educate your palate. How, uh, what do you, what do you know? How do you know what it's going to taste like? Well, test the wine when it first comes out of the bottle. And I remember also you got to cook with a decent wine. Okay? If you're cooking with a $3 bottle of wine, I don't care how long you cook, it's still going to be a $3 bottle of wine. Not going to get any better. Okay, So I want you to test it when you first come out of the bottle. I want you to educate your palate. Remember, you're not born with an educated palate. A palate gets educated. I want you to educate yours. It's very simple. Here's the trick. You're putting wine in the, in the sauce. So first you're gonna test it out of the thing. You put it in the burner. And then 30 seconds after the wine started boiling, I want you to test it. That's when it's gonna be the worst. Think about that, right? You took a bottle of wine, you left it in a car uh, at a hundred and some degree all day and at night, you say, oh, let me drink that wine. It's gonna be terrible, right? It's exactly what happened when you bring it to boil. It tastes terrible. So I want you to educate your palate. So you test it, 30 seconds later, and you go, oh my God, it's bad. How is that gonna get good? Cook it a little bit longer, another 30 seconds. Then test it again. Cook another 30 seconds. Test it again. Cook another 30 seconds. Test it again, and do this until it's nice and smooth. Now remember what I said, if you start with a bad bottle of wine, I don't care how long you cook, it's never gonna get smooth. So I want you to educate your palate. You'll know, then you'll understand why you have to reduce the wine, okay? now. You heard me often also say uh, uh, f fortified wine. Why don't I reduce fortified wine? Like, like, like port, like uh, Madeira, like Marsala. Now, those wine are what we call fortified wine. They contain a distilled spirit, like a brandy and cognac that was added during the winemaking process. Those wine are rich, they're complex. Um, they don't have to be reduced, okay? So it's important. Then you remember that. Fortified wine do not need to be reduced. You can reduce them if you want, but it's not going to do anything. You don't need to. The beauty about a fortified wine, that's why I love to cook with port and, and Madeira, because you can add them at the end. They don't need to be reduced. All right? Okay, so now, friends. Oh, oh one more thing about the wine thing I wanted to show you. It's a trick. It's a, it's a really important thing that I, uh, uh, you know what? I got it. Oh, here it is right here. So when you open up a bottle of wine and you don't drink it all, uh, that, it doesn't happen in my family unless it's a second bottle of wine. Uh, and you know, and you, you want to keep it. If you keep a bottle of wine open in the fridge, uh, the next day or the day after, it's, it's not as good. If you want to keep it that way, uh, uh, what happens is when you open up a wine, the minute you open it up, air gets into it. 
and the, and the air is a danger to food, it's a danger to wine, it's poisoned right away. This is a brand new bottle of wine. Okay, it's, about, it's actually a bottle of Porto. Because Porto, you know, I don't drink at all. Porto is a, I drink it as an after the drug. I don't cook with it all the time. So what I do with this, I, uh, I usually put what is called, this is this device. They call, um, uh, this one I think is called Vacuvin. I'm not really sure how to spell it, but it's a device that takes the air out of your bottle of wine. So if you have a bottle of wine, then you don't drink the whole thing, you want to save it. I don't know what they cost. I don't think they're expensive. It couldn't be that expensive. There's a bunch of it out there. This one, I think, is called vacuum. Look, I want you to hear something when I open up the bottle of wine, okay? You're going to hear the air getting into it, okay? Listen. Okay? Brand new bottles. Oppo. Never been opened before. There's air. Then, then gets into it, and uh, now uh, we want to get rid of the air. So it's a brand new bottle, so it's not going to take me that long. But you put this thing on it, this, uh, this, uh, uh, whatever that is, this the thing, this uh, plastic thing, and 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 you push it and you pull. And when you hear the click, 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 of course I heard it right away. But you may have to do this ten times until you hear the. Click. Make sure when you buy one of those, you buy one that's got a click on it. You'll find them on Amazon. You'll find them online everywhere. They're not, they're not expensive. Okay, so look. When you hear that click, now the wine, uh, the air has been removed. So now let's check it to see if it worked. Well, you didn't hear that much because there's not that much air coming out of it. But I promise you, it works. You can keep your bottle of wine months in the fridge like this with this on it. All right? Just another tip. Nothing to do with uh, being a good cook but being a wine, good wine drinker. Let's go to the next one. Very important tip, friends. Simple, but so important. I see so many people cooking on asparagus, green beans, broccoli, with that first rehydrate them in water, poach them in water. Now, yeah, you can take a broccoli, put it on a, a roasting pan and oil and cook it in the oven. And, okay, yeah, you can do that. But Green beans, asparagus, uh, carrots, you get those beautiful big carrots, you can't cook them in the oven like this. Yeah, you can cut it in half maybe, but do me a favor, put them in boiling water. You have a dinner party, you want to serve beautiful buttered carrots or buttered asparagus or sauteed in green beans. Prepare them in advance, put them in boiling water. As soon as they cook to your liking, take them out, put them in ice, ice water immediately. What that does is that seals in the moisture, that sits in the color. You're going to have beautiful, bright green, green beans. And, you put, and then you take them out, a little water. You can, you can keep them in the fridge. Saute them in a pan with regular butter and garlic. And you'll have yourself fantastic vegetables. So very important tip. Don't forget, poach your vegetables. All right. Another very important tip. And you heard me say it a million times. But there will be a million and one. Onion is always number first. Why? Why is it number one? Why is it number first? Why? I'll explain this very simple. When you saute onion, right? For this is all for the new people that haven't heard me say it a million times yet. When you saute the onion, you notice the onion is white, right? And then you saute it for a minute and it becomes translucent. Or you heard a lot of people tell you, cook the onion until it's translucent. They don't explain why. What happened is the sugar water, the in onion contains sugar water. When you put it in a fry pan, it becomes translucent. That water, now that sugar water is in the pan. Now what you got to do is caramelize that water. You caramelize the sugar water, and it gives you an amazing amount of flavor. Now, think of something. Test it on your raw. Well, you don't really like it. Cook, test them until they poach a little bit or, or just sweating a little bit. You know, sweating is an expression. You sweat your onion until it's sweated, translucent. Sweating, I mean, they sweat. <laughs> they sweat. <laughs> they do, right? And then you sweat over there, you make them caramelized. And test now a, a sweated onion or just sauteed onion and test when it's caramelized. One here, one here. And you see the difference. Huge difference, right? That's why you want to do it. Now, I always say onion is always number first unless there's bacon. And why? Because the fat of the bacon is going to release in the pan. And we're going to use that fat to saute the onion. If we don't have bacon, then we put it in oil. Okay, so really, oil is number first. Okay, but we're not going to confuse anybody. It's confusing enough as it is. So when you're sauteing bacon, and also remember the bacon, friends, saute it slowly, 
because you want the fat to melt it before you have time. Otherwise, you're going to burn the lean part and the fat won't even melt. You need that fat to saute the onion. All right? Okay. Uh, oh, oh, one more thing before I go to the next one on my list, friends. Don't ever do the horizontal cut when you cut an onion. I'm going to do another video on onion because we need it. We need to do a quick short one so everybody sees it. The horizontal cut. Whenever you see somebody do the horizontal cut, they're suicidal. No, it's very dangerous. Don't do that. Cut yourself with a horizontal cut, and it's not necessary. Talk about that in another video. All right. Next thing. Uh, to measure or not. <laughs> that was Jack's idea. To be or not to be. To measure or not. Don't get caught with these measuring tools, friends. You know, and measure this, measure this. Now, you know, when I write a recipe, I got to give some kind of an idea. So I put measurement in it. But sometimes I feel like they, oh, just put whatever you want. It's true, friends. How are you going to measure garlic and herbs and get an idea? So when you look at the recipe, you go, okay, one tablespoon of that. I'm not going to measure, get my tablespoon out. Get an idea. That's what it is. Now, if you're baking, it's a different story. You got to be serious because the chemistry of ingredients when you're baking, when you're cooking, when you're uh, pastries or making bread, you got to measure. That's different. But when you're cooking, I want you to get into it. I want you to get into it in, um, in, 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 in the texture of the food, in the taste of the food, in exactly why you're doing it. So get into it. Don't worry about measuring exactly. You get an idea. Understand why you're putting the ingredients. I always say, you know, I'm making a soup, for instance. I say, put stock. But instead of measuring it, know why you're putting it in here, because you wanted the right texture. Texture is very important. We're going to talk about that in a minute. All right? So get yourself a scale for the important thing. The rest of it, just take it easy. Don't, don't take it too seriously. I would recommend you don't measure most of the stuff, and you'll still be all right. Okay? Whenever possible, friends, another very important tip, I want you to add acid to your food. Vinegar, lemon juice, citrus fruit, they can enhance the flavor and the aroma of your food. They can also offset the fat in your food, like in a vinaigrette, for instance. That's why you're putting vinegar to offset that fat. And, and, uh, the, and the acid can also offset the sweetness of a dish that is too sweet. It can, there's a little bit of lemon in any dessert that is too sweet, works fantastic. Also, don't forget the citric acid in, in lemon juice can also help you tenderize protein, making them more tender and easier to chew on. It can also, uh, the citric acid can also uh, prevent the, 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 the discoloration of the fruits and, and the oxidation of vegetables. So, very important. And, and you know, you're making a sauce and lemon wakes up the ingredients. A little zest of lemon or a little lemon juice in it, you'd be amazed. Think about it as a, as, a, as a brush you're putting on a painting just to finish a little bit, just to wake up all the ingredients. It's very important, friends. All right? So, uh, another, let's go to the next one. Oh, very important, friends. I want you to invest in a thermometer. Okay? They're not expensive. This is probably 20 bucks. Instant read thermometer. Cook fish. Cook meat. Extremely important stuff. Most fish, if you cook them over 135 degrees, you're going to have a dry piece of fish. How do you know it's 135 degrees if you don't have one of those? You don't. So you're guessing, you're touching. And try cook fish, like take a salmon at 125, 130 at the maximum. It'll be nice and moist and delicious. Friend. Get one of those, 20 bucks. They're not expensive. I like the brand Polder, but get whatever you can find. This, friends, I use all the time. This is, uh, again... You put it in your turkey, you put it in your roast, you put it in your chicken, you put in whatever it is you put. You tell the thermometer, hey, let me know when it's at the whatever temperature it is. You know, I know they got those fancy ones now that are remote and put the thing in your pocket, you put it on your phone, and you got to download the app, and then they'll tell you what it is in the ring on your pocket. Hey, your steak is ready. Great. I don't know what they cost. I've used a couple of them. I didn't really like them that much, but maybe I used the wrong one. Put this in your, uh, on your ticket, in your chicken, tell it what you want to be, get an idea of time, and it'll tell you when it's ready to go. 99% of the time you want to overcook your meat, you want to overcook your roast, it's really important. So one of those is good, one of those, and of course, temperature of the oil, 
the uh, laser thermometer. Three thermometers. You know, say, that's a lot of thermometer. You want to be a good cook? You got to have the right tools, okay? Another very important thing, friends, the Maillard reaction. What is it? It's a chemical reaction between reducing sugar and protein. It produces a hundred of different flavor compounds, depending on the, the, the chemical ingredient in your food, depending on the temperature of your food, depending on the cooking time of your food, and how much air there is in your food, in your preparation. Air, yeah, you're going to say. I'll explain. Well, <laughs> when... Uh, when, um, you know, when, you, when I tell you all the time you're sauteing chicken, you're sauteing steak, you're getting meat brown for a stew, I say, don't crowd the pan. What does that mean, don't crowd the pan? Don't crowd the pan, it means then when you're cooking a, a, a chicken and, and you put them all together, they're all stewing together because they're releasing moisture. If you don't have enough air between those two pieces of chicken or those two pieces of meat, the, the moisture of one is going to go into the other and the other, and all of a sudden you're stewing everything, and if you're stewing everything, you are missing the opportunity to create that Maya reaction, that caramelization, that's why it's important. So, remember, the hot pan, put it in, don't touch it, get that Maya reaction going, and make sure they don't touch each other too much. So, air is important, temperature is important to create, and I promise you, you cook a couple of pieces of chicken, a couple of pieces of steak, and you create a beautiful Maya reaction, you'll never not do it again. All right? Let's go to the next one, friends. Very important. Uh, I got a, uh, 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 when you're cooking a food and, uh, and, and you want to strain it, you're cooking, a, let's say, a bell pepper coulis sauce, and you got all the bell peppers in there, and you want to get the most out of it. You want to, instead of just try to do it with a fork or a spoon, you get a ladle. And a ladle, if you notice, the ladle is round like your strainer is, and it makes it easy to just push and scrape everything. So this is a really, really good uh, 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 tool to use, a strainer and a ladle to push uh, when you're straining a sauce or a soup or something. All right? So very important difference. I talk about getting a food scale. I guess I have it on my list here again. I must have talked about it earlier. Very important to get, especially if you're doing a lot of baking and breaking. They don't cost that much money. You can have it in grams. You can have it in ounces. Uh, it's another $20 item. They're not expensive. All right? What else I have on my list? Oh, very important thing. Every recipe tells you <clears throat> at the beginning, anyway, mine do, preheat oven to 375. How many of you actually do that? <laughs> you know, uh, my uh, uh, assistant in the office said, why do you tell them to preheat their oven? I said, well, well I want to make sure they preheat. They said, why, they're going to preheat the neighbor's oven? <laughs> I thought it was cute. Uh, no, you want to preheat your oven because, friends, when you're putting, let's say you, 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 you're having your fish is ready to go and you forgot, so now you're going to turn it on at 375 and you're going to go in. Most oven manufacturers pride themselves for how fast they can get you to the desired temperature. So if you say 375, they want to get you there really fast. How do they do that? They turn on all the burners up to 600 degrees, so the oven is going to really, really get you there fast. But what it's doing is it's 600 degree air going through, so don't do that. You're burn or whatever it is you want to do. That's why you want to preheat the oven so when you open the door, it's 375 instead of 600 going crazy, trying to get you to the right temperature. Preheat the oven, very important. All right? Uh, oh, very important, friends. Garbage bowl. When you're cooking, instead of going to garbage every time, get yourself a bowl, peeling, vegetables, shake. When you're cleaning your cutting board, which you're going to do all the time, boom, in a bowl. Okay, every time. cleaning. I know it's simple stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you do it. It's not new to a lot of you are very good cooks. I see the comment. I know you guys cook very well. So, um, okay, now another thing I want you to do is uh, I want you to learn to trust your palate. But when you test, I want you to be there. Not, you can't just watch TV or watch a really important movie and you're testing it. You're thinking of the movie like, oh, oh my goodness, it's going to kill her. It's going to kill her, and you're testing, and you're testing. You can't be there. You got to be in the moment. 
Um, are you looking for sweet? Are you looking for acid? Are you looking for salt? Do you think you're going to find salt if you're watching a movie and somebody's about to get killed? I know I'm dramatic. It. You can't be having a conversation with somebody and say, let me see if there's salt in there. No, 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 no. You got to think salt. You got to take your salt container, if you're not sure, I promise you. Look at salt. Then test your food. Look at it. I'm telling you, educate your palate, friends. I promise you, I know I get excited, but it's true. There's no way you're going to be able to find salt. And how do you know if there's enough salt if you just, you tell, okay, no, no. You got to concentrate on it. I want you to be there. Be in the moment. Think of what it is you're doing. Now, you can also look at the ingredient. You know what I like to do? I like to look at the ingredient on my recipe at the end and go, oh, uh, I was supposed to have cayenne in this thing. Um, I don't test it at all. I know I put it in there, but I didn't test it at all. So you know what? Add a little bit more. But be careful with cayenne and spice and all that. You want them in the back. You don't want them in the front, meaning you're, you're testing it. Oh, there's cayenne in there. No, of course. You don't want to do that. But what I'm saying is take, look, go through the ingredients. You know, you were supposed to put Worcestershire sauce in there. It's in there, but you test it? No, I don't test it. Go in there and see if you can put a little bit more and then test it again. You know, you put, a, you put a, a lemon juice in there. Do you test it? No? Oh, oh, lemon juice is kind of special. You don't want to really test lemony, but I promise you, if you look for it, it's in there. So be in the dish. Be in the moment. Be serious. Have fun with it, but be in there. Your food is going to be so much better. All right? Why? Wow, another extremely important thing that I'm so glad so many of you have, uh, have paid attention to it and made comment on it. The texture is a conductor of flavor. I want you to think of something. You know that our tongues has anywhere between 2,000 and 8,000 test buds? This, this test buds are going to register sweet, salty, sour, bitterness, and uh, umami, which is like savory, you know. The amount of time the food rests on your tongue can have a huge impact on your, the test of the food. For instance, if a sauce is too thick, uh, it'll stay on your tongue too long. If the sauce is too thin, it passes right through the tongue and all the test buds down to the hatch before you have time to even, the test bud will go, what happened? Something went by, I had no idea what was in it because I couldn't test it, it went there too fast because it was too thin. The texture of the food is a conductor of flavor. Think of that when you're making a stew or a sauce or a mashed potato, a vinaigrette, anything. Think about the vinaigrette, right? You make a good oil and the vinegar, and you go with a fork, and you mix it, and you got an oily concoction. Now, you take that same vinaigrette, and you take an emulsion blender, and you emulsify all the ingredients. Now, instead of having an oily concoction, you got a creamy, smooth goodness on your salad instead of oily. All you did was changing the texture. The texture is a conductor of flavor. You make a soup too thin, it tastes like nothing. You make it too thick, and it tastes like, oh, mamma mia, it's like a mashed potatoes. So think of texture. How does it feel on your tongue? Again, be there, be in the moment. Don't forget, the texture, the conductor of flavor, you take the same exact sauce. What you do is changing the, 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 the texture of it. You make it a little thicker. Oh, you know what you can do also <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Butter, change it, it makes it more creamy. All right. Knife skill, very important. I want you to learn to use a knife correctly. We made a nice video on how to use a knife correctly, how to chop, how to dice, how to use your knife correctly. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you watch it, but it's very important. Very important you keep your knife sharp. We're doing a video of all the best knife sharpener. It's coming out right now. We're filming it. So it'll come out in the next couple of weeks, two or three weeks, okay? We're working on it right now. It's very important. I want you to learn to use the knife correctly. I want you to learn to use a very sharp knife. Because at the end of the day, if your knife is dull, it's much more dangerous than a sharp knife. Sharp knife, you know how to use it. You keep your finger out of the way. You're not going to cut yourself. A dull knife, if it's dull, you push on your bell pepper to cut, on your tomato to cut. And what do you do? When you push, you slip. And when you slip, you come. And it might be too hard to cut the bell pepper, but it won't be too hard to get your skin. But if you're pushing it, you have more strength of it to go. So 
a, a sharp knife. First, know how to use it correctly, so spend the time. Be disciplined. Have fun. You know, you can have a lot of fun. You know, I always tell people, if you don't know how to play golf, when you go to the golf course and say, I'm going to play golf this afternoon, or you don't know how to play piano, you're not going to go there and play piano if you don't know how to play for three hours. But if you know how to play golf, you're going to go, hey, I'm going to go to the golf. I'm going to play golf for three, four hours because you know how to do it. Guess what? In the French kitchen, the stove is called a piano. Yeah. In a, in a commercial French kitchen, get back behind the piano. You know how many times a chef would tell me that when I was an apprentice? Get back behind the piano. <laughs> and uh, so um, uh, if you know how to play the, with the ingredient, if you know how to play with the thing, you're going to have a good time doing it. That's what I want you to educate yourself. Know, know how to use the knife correctly. All right, next one. Very important, friends. Uh, we talked about the dough scraper. Really, don't forget, I hope I, I may have forgot to say it, but if I forgot, here it is. Make sure you get one of those. Never use water in cooking. Water is the enemy. Think about it. You're making the soup. You want to put three cups of water or you want to put three cups of a beautiful chicken stock or a vegetable stock or a fish stock or whatever it is you want, a nice vegetable stock instead of water. Water tastes like nothing. Why do I want to put nothing in the ingredient? Now, once in a while, I have to admit, I may use a little water. You know, if I'm making a hollandaise, for instance, I may use a little bit of it. A certain, certain time in baking, I use a little bit of water. Every so often, I like to dilute my cornstarch in water. I find that it dilutes better than doing it in stock. But So sometimes water is okay, so it's not the total enemy. <laughs> but try to avoid using water as much as possible because it doesn't taste like anything. Get yourself some good stock. Learn. Go to the store. You know, I was going to do a, a video, friends, on pick the best chicken stock. I went to five, six big grocery stores. Everybody had different brands, and a lot of them. But our public grocery store probably has 15 different brands of it. It's amazing. Uh, when dixie has another 15 brands. They're all different brands. They're all different uh, brands. So it would be very difficult to come up with one or two or three good ones. It's just amazing how many there is. Costco has their own brand. Everybody's got their own brand. So it's very difficult to do, to do your own. But here's what I do. You go to the grocery store, you find... Two or three, you buy them at the same time. Let's say, let's say you need, uh, you, you, want, you don't want to make it yourself. Of course, if you could make it yourself, it's even better. But let's say you can't because you're too busy. You got too, too many things to do. You don't have time to make stock or you don't have the kitchen to do it. You want to buy. So buy three or four brand. Let, let's say you need six cups. Let's say you need 12 cups to make a nice soup. Buy two brand side by side and test them that day. Oh, I like this one better. Good. Then next time, buy that one and another brand. And do it again, and do it again until you do the test for yourself and you have eliminated the one you don't like. Some of them, ah, mama mia, they're really, really bad. All right, friends. One more thing, very important. I see there's a few more, actually. Uh, learn to cut the vegetables the right size. And what does that mean exactly? Well, if you're making a stir fry and you're going to put bell peppers, for instance, shrimp or chicken, stir fry. They're going to be in there a very short amount of time. So unless you like raw bell peppers, you want to cut them very small so they're going to cook super fast. So if you're going to make julienne, make them nice and small. Now let's say you're putting bell pepper in a chicken stew. That's going to cook 45 minutes. Cook them be bigger. But now let's say you want to put bell pepper in a beef stew. That's going to cook two and a half, three hours. You're going to cut them much bigger. Remember, the size of it is extremely important. Same thing with potatoes, same thing with asparagus, same thing with any vegetable. The size of it matters, and they all have to be the same size, so they cook at the same speed. All right? So it's very important to learn, well, 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 how long am I going to cook this for? How big do I want to make them? So if you're following somebody else's recipe and they say diced bell pepper, you don't know what size to make them, but if you know you're going to be in there really quick, you want to cut them small, otherwise they're not going to have time to cook. All right? Um, one, one, uh, one more thing. There's so many other things to think about. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, again, I, 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 I kind of talked a little bit earlier, just a little bit about the butter. But remember, uh, in, in France, for instance, we have an expression when we finish the sauce. It says, monter au beurre, meaning mount the sauce with butter. 
And what it really means is, uh, is creating this, uh, this amazing, uh, silky, buttery texture in a sauce, but you have to do it off the heat. Don't forget, of the heat, otherwise it'll separate, it'll be oily, and it defeats the whole purpose. It's not gonna mount the sauce, it's not gonna make it to a little thicker, quite the contrary. It's gonna completely ruin the whole thing. So make sure when you put butter at the end, the heat is off, okay? And I find that instead of cold butter, you wanna make it, at, you wanna put it kinda like at room temperature. Because you put it in a cold butter, the outside of the butter, it's gonna to be totally melted before the inside of it. That's why I like the room temperature because you put it in and immediately mix up. And you don't have to overcook it and let it separate. All right? Now, uh, oh, I gotta go get this. There's one more thing I gotta get you. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Fresh herb. I made a quick you know, uh, one of them short videos. <laughs> People would say, hey, you're doing some tic-tac-talk. -tac. I'm not really doing tic-tac-talk. -tac. I'm just doing shorts for YouTube for you guys. Like, you, you know, you may not want to uh, watch a whole video of how I make bacon bits or, or how I cut broccoli or how I, I cut an onion. You, you can watch one of the short ones. It only take one minute because it only can be one minute. I made one for this. But I'm going to do it for those of you that I've not seen. How do you keep your fresh herb? Because, you know, oh, this is kind of like a type of way of type container. It's containers in a restaurant business. We get our fish delivered in there. We call it the fish fish pot. But, you know, it's a type of wear container, whatever it is. Something sealed. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. I take a, I put a towel on it. And this is a, a, a moist towel. And I put a pepper towel. And underneath the pepper towel, I have my herb. So, you know, it, it, usually I know what I'm going to cook for the week. So I make my list on Sunday the stuff that I can buy. So I don't have to go to the grocery store every day. I make my list. I know I'm going to need rosemary tomorrow. I know I'm going to need thyme the day after. Uh, and, 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 and tarragon and sage. Or whatever it is you put in here. Your fresh herb are going to stay at least a week, maybe two weeks. Some of them are going to last a week. Sage, two weeks. Rosemary, two weeks. Easy. Two and a half weeks probably with this. Thyme's got two, two and a half weeks. Now tarragon, parsley. Uh, parsley a long time. But sage... Deal, they don't last that long. Basil, forget about it. It doesn't last good at all. Forget about it. That's the, the basil doesn't last at all. You know when I have extra basil, what I do? I make a little pesto. Make a little pesto and freeze it. You know, when I need it, I stay, all right? So, so you put your other pepper towel on top, and you got it right there, friends, right? And boom, voila. And this, I promise you, friends, is the way to... to I close my container and I get the air out. Boom. This will keep my herbs two, three, four weeks. Depends which one it is and how fresh they were when I got them. All right? Let's get to the next one. Capro more. I always talk about it and they're not in the right order, as you can see. They're not in the order of importance. They are in the order that I thought about it. <laughs> is sauteed garlic. I, you know, I, you know, I don't put onion and garlic together because I believe that the onion needs time and the garlic doesn't need time. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of people like brown garlic. God bless them. That's their garlic. They cook however they want. It's their food. They like the flavor of, of, of burnt garlic or, or caramelized garlic, whatever you want to call it. As far as I'm concerned, when there's color in the garlic too high, I mean, I don't mind a little golden. Uh, but when you saute garlic, you get too much color, it's going to start becoming bitter. The reason why I put garlic in food is because I love the fragrance of garlic. Think about something, right? You're putting, fry, you're sauteing something on your own, or you're sauteing, yeah, on your own, and, and, and let's say chicken or, or shrimp or whatever it is, you saute, and then you're going to put garlic on it, right? You put it, like you have the garlic, you're smelling it, it smells, yeah, if you put your nose on it, you can smell it, but if you leave it right here, you can't smell it, right? Now, you take that garlic and you put it in a hot pan. Mix it up. Within 30 seconds, what do you get? You got that amazing aroma. So, I tell everybody, it's really simple, friends. You, you got a choice now. You can flavor the house, because it really flavors good, right? It smells amazing. Oh, what are you cooking? It smells amazing in here. Yeah, garlic. Hey, so, the aroma is gone in your hair and your clothes and the whole kitchen. And then you think it's going to stay in the pan? No, 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 it doesn't. Because as soon as that aroma is gone, it's not like there is like six, 
they, they say, uh, uh, a lot of them come out. After a while, it doesn't say, smell that good. All of a sudden, that fragrance, floral, floral fragrance is gone. And when we got the bitterness and the acidity of the garlic. So if that's what you like, God bless you. And, 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 and it's fine. What I do is the minute I smell it, I put something wet on it. Wine, broth, tomatoes, whatever it is, something wet to protect this beautiful aroma. So when I test it, I have it back. Matter of opinion, believe me, I've known some fantastic chefs that burned the garlic and their food was delicious. So I'm not putting that down. If that's the way you like to do it, do it that way. I like the floral component of garlic, the delicate flavor of garlic. There's no right or wrong here. You do it the way you like it. All right? Uh, another very important tip that, I, that I've taught a lot of you, uh, when I make gravy, when I make soup, when I make sauce, and I want to thicken it, I take a strainer, and I put it in the soup, in the sauce, in the whatever it is, and I put flour in it, and I mix it up like this, and it incorporates flour without you having to make a blend of flour and water, whatever it is you're doing, and add it to it. This is a great way to do it. I've used it a lot. A lot of you have commented on it, and you love this tip. I think it's a great tip to use to thicken any soup, any sauces. I just want to remind you as a side thing, if you're going to put flour, remember in a dish rinse, you want to put the flour at the beginning of the dish so, uh, so it has time to cook. You want to cook out the raw taste of flour, but you have to be careful also. If you're going to make a stew, for instance, going to cook for two or three hours on the stove, the flour, if you put it too much at the beginning, has tendency to fall in the bottom, and if it falls in the bottom, it's going to attach in your pot. So it's okay as long as you're there constantly mixing. Not to stress out if you're making a stew and you want to use that technique to add the flour at the end, then you, uh, you use it like 15, 20 minutes before it's finished so the flour has time to cook. I don't want to confuse the issue. But we made a good video also on how to cook the perfect roux. And, uh, and Jack is going to give you a link to that video. You can refer to it. It's another fantastic way to thicken sauce also. But I wanted to address that because it's really a good tip. And, and if you haven't seen it yet, you thicken any soup, any sauce, is fantastic. All right? Um, very important also. I know it's not really an important tip, but for those of you that are like asparagus, I always say don't peel the asparagus. No, peel the asparagus. Don't cook them without peeling them, please. And especially if you got the big asparagus, which are my favorite one. If you got a little ding dong one, they even have more uh, 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 peel. You got to get rid of it. The big one are easier because they're easier to peel. The little little one, they got more. If you were to, to calculate the square footage of it, there is more skin in the little one per square footage than the big one. And they're very difficult and they're chewy. You can't eat the whole asparagus if you don't peel it. If you peel, you can eat the whole thing. Just cut a little bit at the end. So it's a little trick. But it's very important for those of you that like asparagus, all right? Um, another very important thing, friends, brine your pork. You brine a pork tenderloin, friends, in the salt water. Uh, you'll never not brine it again. A pork tenderloin, a pork chop, a pork loin. You'll never not brine it again. It's just so important for you to do, friends. We have a lot of videos on pork, and, uh, and, we, and we show you how to do it. I promise you, you take a, a pork loin, a pork tenderloin, or a pork loin, and you brine it correctly for a few hours, you saute it, cook it in the oven, you'll never not brine it again. It'll be as moist, as tender, as the best filet mignon you've ever had. So, very important. Don't forget to brine your pork. All right? Now, another very important thing, and I said in a lot of the videos, so a lot of you have seen that before, but if you, you have a recipe and it says two tablespoons of freshly chopped herb, thyme, rosemary, whatever, say if it says two tablespoons of fresh, what do you do? If you use dry, cut it in half. Remember, your dry herb, they don't last forever, friends. If you have a dry herbs, then you've had it for 17 years. I probably doesn't taste like whatever it's on, on the label anymore. Buy fresh ones. They don't last very long. A year or two, maybe. Smell them. If they smell good, you know they're going to be good. If you put them in and you can test them, great. If you can't test them, get a new one. All right? Uh, friends. I think I could speak a lot longer, but I don't want to make the video too long. It's probably already too long. Jack is going, oh yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a long one. Uh, I wanted to give you the most important tips, 
You, by the way, thank you to all of you that have responded. Uh, amazing how many of you have responded, giving me your long list of all the important things you've learned, and I'm grateful. This is why I do this YouTube channel, is to share what I've learned in the last 50 plus years as a chef. So I'm privileged that I have this honor. So thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. And, uh, and, and don't forget, experiment. Get into the moment, get into your food, have fun with it. All right, friends, thanks for watching. I hope you learned a couple of more, th more things. And uh, we we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you again with another fantastic video. Thanks for watching. Nice. <sighs> <laughs> Was it me saying it's gonna be too long or you're stuck? <laughs> 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 okay. I'm good now. <laughs>